This is a hearing of the Strategic Forces Subcommittee of the House Armed Services will come to order. And I uh, want to ask unanimous consent that Mr. Cobble Hall be uh, uh, allowed to sit on this hearing uh, since he's not a member of the full house. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, we're, uh, let's see what, we're pleased today to have two witnesses with us, uh, General John Hyten, Commander U.S. Strategic Command, uh, no stranger to this subcommittee, and uh, a newer one, uh, Mr. Uh, John Rood, uh, Under Secretary for Defense Policy. Thank you both for testifying and, and being here with us today. We know it takes a lot of time to get ready for these hearings, and uh, we appreciate the time you put into it and your service to our country. Uh, what we're going to do, because we're going to be called for votes at 4 o'clock, uh, Jim and I are going to, uh, the ranking member and I are going to submit our opening statements for the record so that we can go uh, directly to, to questions, uh, if that's okay with y'all. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, and what I'll do is I'll ask uh, either one of you who, who wants to start first with your opening statement, and we'll recognize Mr. Rood for your opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Cooper, distinguished members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on the President's FY19 budget request for strategic forces. In terms of the security environment and strategic pr priorities, I'll just briefly summarize that. Uh, today, the United States faces an increasingly complex global security environment in which the central challenge to our prosperity and security is the reemergence of long-term strategic competition by revisionist powers in China and Russia. While they pose separate challenges with unique attributes, both China and Russia seek to reshape the world order and change territorial borders. Consequently, they pose increasing security threats to us, our allies, and our partners. Long-term competition with China and Russia requires increased U.S. and allied military investment because the magnitude of the threats they pose today and the potential that these threats will increase in the future. We must also simultaneously strengthen our efforts to deter and counter the clear and present dangers posed by rogue regimes such as North Korea and Iran. The U.S. military remains the strongest in the world. However, our advantages are eroding as potential adversaries modernize and build up their conventional and nuclear forces. They now field a broad arsenal of advanced missiles, including variants that can reach the American homeland. For example, only last week, Russian President Putin claimed publicly that Russia now possesses unprecedented new types of nuclear forces with which to target the U.S. and our allies. While this picture is unsettling and clearly not what we desire, as Secretary, Mattis, Secretary of Defense Mattis has pointed out, quote, we must look reality in the eye and see the world as it is, not as we wish it to be, end quote. The administration has heeded this admonition in our recent strategic reviews, the National Security Strategy, the National Defense Strategy, and the Nuclear Posture Review. They reflect a consistent and pragmatic assessment of the threats and uncertainties we face regarding the future security environment. Our task at the Defense Department is to ensure that the U.S. military advantages endure, and in combination with other elements of national power, that we are fully able to meet the increasing challenges to our national security. Weakness invites challenges and provocation, but as both George Washington and Thomas Jefferson observed, American strength deters war and promotes peace. It also assures our allies and attracts new partners. Strengthening our alliances and attracting new partners is a critical element of retaining our advantages. As the National Defense Strategy points out, quote, mutually beneficial alliances and partnerships are crucial to our strategy, providing a durable, asymmetric advantage that no competitor or rival can match. This approach has served the United States well in peace and war, end quote. The 2018 Nuclear Posture Review reflects DOD's strategic priority to maintain a safe, secure, survivable, and effective nuclear deterrent. The logic of the NPR was best articulated by Secretary Mattis when he said, quote, this review rests on a bedrock truth. Nuclear weapons have and will continue to play a critical role in deterring nuclear attack and preventing large-scale conventional warfare between nuclear armed states for the foreseeable future. U.S. nuclear weapons not only defend our allies against conventional nuclear threats, they also help them avoid the need to develop their own nuclear arsenals. This, in turn, furthers global security." End quote. Effective deterrence is critical to our security, and in a complex and dynamic security environment, there is no one-size-fits-all approach to deterrence. 
The requirements for effective U.S. deterrence can vary greatly depending on the perceptions, goals, interests, strengths, strategies, and vulnerabilities of different potential adversaries. The deterrence strategy effective against one potential adversary may not deter another. Consequently, the 2018 NPR calls for the United States to tailor deterrence as necessary across a spectrum of adversaries, threats, and contexts. The 2018 NPR confirms the findings of all previous NPRs that the diverse capabilities of the nuclear triad provide the flexibility and resilience needed for deterrence. Unfortunately, each leg of the triad is now operating far beyond its originally planned service life. Consequently, we must not delay the recapitalization of the triad initiated by the previous administration. We're off to a good start. The 2019 budget request funds all critical Defense Department modernization requirements, helping to ensure that modern replacements will be available before the nation's legacy systems reach the end of their extended service lives. The FY19 budget request for nuclear forces is $24 billion, which includes $11 billion for nuclear force sustainment and operations, $7 billion for recapitalization programs, including the LRSO, B-21, GBSD and Columbia class SSBN, and $6 billion for nuclear command control and communications. In addition, the President's budget request includes two supplemental capabilities to, to enhance deterrence against emerging challenges in the near and midterm. The Department requests funds to modify a small number of existing SLBM warheads to provide a low yield ballistic missile option in the near term. We also request funds to initiate an analysis of the performance requirements and costs to pursue a modern nuclear-armed sea launch cruise missile that could be available in the midterm. These proposed supplements would contribute to deterrence by raising the threshold for nuclear use. They would do so by denying potential adversaries confidence that their coercive threats of limited nuclear first use or actual first use can provide a useful advantage over us and our allies. These supplements do not and are not intended to mimic adversary nuclear capabilities. They can nonetheless help address the imbalance in U.S. and Russian non-nuclear strategic forces and create incentives for Russia to return to compliance with its nuclear arms control commitments. The U.S. commitment to non-proliferation and arms control remains strong. The U.S. remains committed to all of our obligations under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, including Article 6. We will continue to use arms control measures like the New START Treaty, non-proliferation measures, and counter-nuclear terrorism measures to advance the security of the United States and our allies and partners. Let me now turn to missile defense. The Department's FY19 budget request supports the President's directions as set out in the National Security Strategy to develop a layered missile defense system to protect the American homeland from North Korean and Iranian missile threats. Our missile defense system not only protects the American people, it strengthens deterrence of war and assurance of allies. Today, the ground-based mid-course defense system provides this protection for the U.S. homeland. It consists of 44 ground-based interceptors deployed in Alaska and California, land, sea, and space-based sensors, and a command and control system. We are strengthened in this GMD system and investing in technologies to ensure that we can continue to counter rogue state missile threats to our homeland. Doing so is one of our highest priorities. For this purpose, last September, DOD requested the reprogramming of FY17 funding of over $400 million to counter the North Korean missile threat. Congress approved this request. A portion of these funds support important homeland defense activities, including initiating work on the procurement of 20 additional ground-based interceptors in Alaska as early as 2023, which will bring the total to 64 fielded interceptors. The reprogramming also funded a service life extension to the Cobra Dane radar in Alaska and software upgrades to the sea-based X-band radar. In November, the President submitted an amendment to his FY18 budget request for $4 billion for homeland and regional missile defense, which included construction of a new missile field at Fort Greeley, Alaska, and additional procurement for 20 additional GBIs. The FY19 budget request includes $9.9 billion for the Missile Defense Agency and $3 billion for air and missile defense activities in the military services. The budget includes funding for a more capable GBI with the redesigned kill vehicle, the de 
deployment of new missile tracking and discrimination sensors in Alaska, Hawaii, and the Pacific region, and a new space-based kill assessment capability. We're also moving forward to bolster homeland defenses against air and cruise missile threats. In 2018, we'll complete the first part of a two-phase effort to provide surveillance against these threats for the national capital region. Doing so will enhance our ability to detect, track, and investigate suspicious aircraft as well as cruise missiles, and when necessary, cue our missile defense systems. We're on track to complete the second phase of this effort in fiscal year 19. We're also looking into technologies and concepts that could be used to provide scalable and deployable options for the rest of North America. The department's FY19 budget request also continues deployment of regional missile defenses tailored to meet threats to U.S. forces abroad, allies and partners in Europe, the Middle East, and the Asia-Pacific region. The budget seeks to enhance our regional missile defense capability through additional Patriot, THAAD, and SM-3 Block 1B and 2A interceptors. Because systems such as Patriot and THAAD and our Aegis ballistic missile defense capable ships can be surged when and where required, they make it possible to deploy layered missile defense capabilities that are responsive to regional missile defense missile threats as they arise. We're encouraging our allies and partners to acquire missile defense capabilities and to strengthen cooperation and interoperability. We're pleased with the progress NATO, that at NATO to build greater missile defense capabilities and important collaborative efforts with allies in the Middle East and Asia. Potential adversaries are modernizing and expanding their missile capabilities. We must ensure, therefore, our missile defense investment strategy and priorities enable us to meet the most dangerous threats we face today while also enabling us to counter future missile threats as they expand. Areas for work on advanced technology include advanced improved discrimination, excuse me, in our missile defense system sensor architecture, lasers to intercept offensive missiles during their most vulnerable boost phase of flight, and the multi-object kill vehicle. With respect to our space policy and posture, let me say, U.S. space systems are essential to our prosperity, security, and way of life. And DOD's space capabilities are critical for effective deterrence, defense, and U.S. force projection capabilities. Consequently, DOD must be prepared to address threats to our national security assets located in space. Due to the critical importance of these assets, the national security strategy states, quote, any harmful interference with or an attack upon critical comp components of our space architecture that directly affects this vital U.S. interest will be met with a deliberate response at a time, place, manner, and domain of our choosing, end quote. The President's FY19 budget request includes $12.5 billion to take steps to establish a more resilient, defendable space architecture uh, this is an increase of $1.1 billion from the FY18 budget request. The United States, however, I would add, does not fight alone. Uh, bringing together our allies and partners to share capabilities and information strengthens deterrence and defense. Cost-sharing agreements, hosting U.S. national security payloads on foreign systems, and data-sharing arrangements to bolster shared space situational awareness are just a few of the opportunities that our allies and partners provide. Mr. Chairman, let me conclude by stating that in this increasingly complex and threatening security environment, the Defense Department must sustain the capabilities needed to deter and defend against attacks on our homeland, U.S. forces deployed abroad, allies and partners. We must make the investments needed to address the ongoing erosion of our advantages and remain the preeminent military power in the world. Along with our allies and partners, we must ensure that we have the capabilities needed now and in the future to protect our people and the freedoms we so cherish and are able to engage potential adversaries diplomatically from a position of strength. To do so, I urge you to support the important capabilities funded in the President's FY19 budget request. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to be here before you today. Thank you. General Hyten, you're recognized for your opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Cooper. Uh, it's an honor to be here today with Under Secretary Rood, and it's a continuing privilege to represent the 184,000 Americans that uh, serve the missions of U.S. Strategic Command. I want to start by thanking this committee for your enduring support uh, for our nation's defense. And with your approval, I'd like my full statement to be made part of the record. 
So as we begin to get, it's important for me to note that uh, although we now have a bipartisan budget act, which is a very significant step to ensuring our future security, we're nonetheless still operating under a continuing resolution that will expire on March the 23rd. So I respectfully request quick action by the Congress to pass a final budget to ensure that our all-volunteer force remains fully trained and equipped to meet on not only the threats of today, but the emerging threats of the future. And the first and most important message I want to deliver today is that the forces under my command are fully ready to deter our adversaries and respond decisively should that deterrence fail. We're ready for all the threats that are out there, and no one, no one should doubt this. We just have to make sure that future STRATCOM commanders will always be able to make that statement. Because we're a global warfighting command, we set the conditions, the conditions across the globe as the ultimate guarantor of our national and allied security. Our forces and capabilities underpin and enable all other joint force operations. We're a global warfighting command. The strength of the command is its people. The soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, and civilians of the enterprise have the most important mission in our entire department. Their hard work and dedication ensures our nation's strategic ability, capabilities remain safe, secure, reliable, and ready, and sustained congressional support will ensure we remain ready, agile, and effective for deterring strategic attack, assuring our allies and partners today and in the future. Secretary Root already talked about the NPR. He also talked about our modernization. I'll defer the comments I have on that to your questions and answers. And so, Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to be here again today, and I look forward to taking your questions. Great. Thank you, General Hyde. Thank you both for being here as we begin to examine the President's uh, FY19 uh, uh, budget proposal. I'll recognize myself first for questions. Um, Under Secretary Rood, many uh, discuss strategic stability uh, in the context of missile defense and the need to be cognizant of how the U.S. actions, development uh, efforts, and deployment of cap capability can disrupt this balance. From your perspective, especially in light of the recent statements from Russia regarding their cap uh, capability to strike the U.S. with a, quote, invincible weapon, close quote, uh, can our missile defense systems be compared to what's being done by Russia and China to threaten this strategic stability? Uh, Mr. Chairman, the missile defense system that the United States has uh, developed and fielded to date would not have the capability to negate the Russian or Chinese uh, strategic nuclear arsenal. Uh, that has not been our, our planning focus, and the capabilities developed do not enable us to do that. I think the statements made by uh, Russian President Putin, while not surprising, were nonetheless disappointing. Uh, while we have been aware of the development of Russia's capabilities and watching with concern some of the development that has occurred in terms of Russia's doctrine and their exercise program, it's nonetheless disappointing to see that uh, the President of the Russian Federation choose to feature these capabilities in the way that, uh, that he did. I think with respect to China, they are developing a, a very large uh, strategic offensive nuclear force, and so that is of concern. Uh, both countries are pursuing hypersonic weapons and other capabilities, and their behavior in the cyber domain and, and elsewhere concerns us. All of those things is a piece are concerning and why in the national defense strategy uh, we highlighted those two countries as our primary and central focus for our, uh, our national security efforts going forward. Great. Uh, well, recently President Putin announced uh, that Russia was pursuing and fielding four new nuclear weapons because the U.S. refuses to engage in arms control and is developing missile defenses um, to thwart Russia's strategic forces. Are these reactions to the 2810 NPR, uh, or have they been in development for years? Uh, no, you're correct, uh, Mr. Chairman. Those capabilities have obviously been in development for quite some time. Uh, President Putin talked about their maturity. They, ha they are clearly not capabilities that were developed within the last uh, few months or last year. Uh, they have been at work. Uh, with regard to our commitment to arms control, uh, the United States remains committed to our arms control obligations. Uh, that remains unchanged. Regrettably, the Russian Federation's track record in terms of its adherence to its arms control uh, obligations leaves a great deal wanting. As you know, we have uh, found that it's been a policy of the United States government in the last administration and this to find that uh, Russia is in violation of its commitments under the INF Treaty, for example. We've seen Russian violations on other agreements. Nonetheless, we remain committed to our obligations and the New START Treaty uh, and prepared to have conversations in this regard with our Russian colleagues. 
But I think it would be a mistake to assign the development of capabilities that have been in work for many years to any developments that happened in the last few months. Uh, you made uh, reference in your opening statement uh, to the uh, additional 20 GBIs that we authorized and appropriated money for in this current NDAA, which we're all very excited about uh, because while we did have 44, you know, they all weren't or aren't available at all times because of work that's having to be done on some of them. But I, I'm a big believer that that 20 was a good start to where we need to go. I'd be curious to know your thoughts and General Hyten's thoughts on the need for more after these 20 uh, are implemented. From Given the, the threats around the world and our shot doctrine, which we won't go into. Yes, sir. The, regrettably, the missile defense, uh, rather the missile threats that we face around the world, that threat picture is continuing to mature, both in scale and in complexity. It's incumbent on us that we continue to maintain the ability to defend this nation from those kinds of ballistic missile capabilities in the hands of countries like North Korea and Iran. And so we, we have sought, as you noted, in the reprogramming request and the supplemental budget request last year to give a boost to those efforts, and the FY19 budget request carries that forward. It's always a, a and this is one of the questions we're seeking to answer as part of the missile defense review, um, what is the best way of doing that? The addition of additional systems such as the GBIs, measured as well with sensor capabilities and improvements in discrimination, and the robustness of the overall architecture. And so all of those things working as a, as a system of systems to produce the improvement is what we're trying to optimize. And so clearly, greater capability than the United States possesses today will be required. And the, the threat is not resting, uh, so we must keep pace with it, uh, General. So I believe you'll see the details in the Missile Defense Review shortly, uh, but I've been uh, consistent in my view that uh, we need to continue to monitor the missile defense uh, capabilities that we're building to make sure they respond to the threats that we face. Uh, and I believe that uh, the prioritization of resources that we have in the future should go along the, the following construct. Uh, the first thing we need is better sensor capability, better tracking capabilities to make sure we understand and can characterize and then respond to that threat. The second piece we need is better kill vehicles on the top of our interceptors uh, so that, that uh, those kill vehicles become more and more lethal in terms of their ability to respond. And then the third thing we, we need is more capacity. Uh, I think we have to do those three things simultaneously. I think those are the priorities that I have that I've uh, stated uh, both in my statement for the record as well as multiple times over the year. I'll continue to be consistent in pushing for those three elements of future missile defense capabilities. Okay, great. My last question is for you, General Hyten. Uh, you are known to say that you want to see us go fast, faster than we've been going. And one of the reasons, as I understand it, that the M Missile Defense Agency was created was so it could go faster. And, uh, and, and it was pulled out uh, from the department for that reason. There's discussion now about pulling it back into the department under uh, the R&E the uh, seg uh, section. Uh, I'm concerned that that's going to bureaucratize it again and slow it down. What are your thoughts about that? So um, I hate bureaucracy. Uh, I hate any additional bureaucracy that causes the, the department to go slow. Uh, I don't think the organizational issue uh, is necessarily a concern. I like the authorities the Missile Defense Agency has, and whatever structure we talk about it coming out of the Missile Defense Review, we have to make sure that we maintain those authorities to allow it to go fast. We can still go faster on the Missile Defense side as well. The one thing I'll point out about R&E, though, is that uh, Mike Griffin has now been confirmed to be uh, R&E in the Department of Defense. Uh, there's nobody I know that's more technically sound and hates bureaucracy and wants to go fast than Mike Griffin. So I believe there's a partnership there that can be made, but I would not advocate for lessening the authorities that the Missile Defense Agency has right now. Thank you very much. Chair uh, recognizes the ranking member for any questions he may have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the witnesses. In view of the number of participants in this hearing and the shortness of time, I'm going to defer my questions to the closed session. Thank you. Chair, and I recognize the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Lamborn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you both for being here and the ways that you've served our country. Uh, thank you, General Hyten, for coming by earlier. It was always good to touch base. Um, and because of the shortness of the time, like the ranking member said, I'm just going to ask one question. Uh, and this is for both of you. We all know that, and you've 
just addressed it, General Hyten, that we need to have better space sensors. Um, we need to look for other strategic uses of directed energy and, and things like that, that so we stay ahead of uh, potential adversaries. But when I look at the fiscal year 19 uh, president's budget, I see that uh, those kinds of things are uh, zeroed out. So what's going on there from a funding standpoint? In terms of what's going on from a funding standpoint for efforts to be zeroed out for directed energy? No, for, well, space sensors in particular. Uh, and the missile defense tracking system, which is a space-based sensor layer. So I'll address that, uh, uh, Congressman Lamborn. So as you look across those pieces and you talked about the, uh, the need for increased space sensors and, and where that is in the 19 budget, you talked about the, uh, the need for directed energy uh, pieces. So concerning the mid-course uh, tracking system, the NPS system, it was in the 18 uh, supplemental uh, for MDA, a small number, I think somewhere over $10 million to begin the pursuit of that capability. Um, we had that discussion within the department. The department made a decision that uh, what we'll do in the 19 budget, and you'll find it actually in the Air Force budget line under the missile warning sensor technology, a line for $42 million to, to build demonstration capabilities to explore that piece. That $42 million will go at developing the technology we need for those capabilities. Uh, the, the second piece of the puzzle, and maybe more important, is, is not a funding issue, and that is uh, the United States Air Force and the Missile Defense Agency this year under the Department of Defense have agreed to get together to work out an integrated set of requirements and programs for how we use space and the infrared element of space, overhead persistent IR, uh, to do all of these missions and to come in to the department and come into Congress next year with a fully integrated program to do the missile warning missions, the missile defense missions, the threat characterization missions, all those pieces together. So that work will be ongoing this year while at the same time the technology work will be ongoing. Nonetheless, I have advocated for that capability for a long time. 30 years of my life I've advocated. I believe we're ready to go into that. We need to move quickly. I appreciate where the department is on that. We have to make the decisions this year where we're going in the future. Okay, thank you so much. I understand better that things are moving forward. Uh, my initial impression and my staff uh, uh, needed to be updated, so I really appreciate that. I'm glad to see that these efforts are indeed starting to pay off. Thank you. And I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back, Chair, and I recognize the lady from California, Ms. Davis, for any questions. Thank you. From you thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll defer to uh, closed session as well. Chair, and I recognize the gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Brooks, for your questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's always good to see General Height and a local boy uh, done well uh, from Huntsville, <laughs> Alabama. I don't know if the chairman mentioned that, uh, but I wanted to emphasize it. Roll Tide. <laughs> Roll Tide, for the record. All right. That works with me. And also, go Duke Blue Devils, since that's my other alma mater. But that doesn't do, do so well with those Carolina folks. Um, mutually assured destruction doctrine. That has kept the peace to a very large degree between uh, the United States and China on the one hand and uh, the Soviet Union, now Russia, on the other. Uh, with the improvements in technology and capabilities of China and Russia, uh, does the mutually assured destruction doctrine still work or have uh, either China or Russia been able to get to the point where they have been able to overcome uh, that counter threat that has helped keep the peace? Uh, Congressman, Nuclear deterrence remains uh, vitally important to our country, and we rely principally on nuclear deterrence to address those kinds of challenges from Russia and China, and certainly to an extent other countries such as North Korea. I, I think the concepts and the fundamentals of nuclear deterrence still hold in this environment, but in the way that we approach those, utilize those fundamental principles, we need to be more supple and more tailored and have a broader range of capabilities in our approach. And the Nuclear Posture Review talks about a tailored approach to deterrence. For example, we're concerned about some of the doctrine we see emanating from Russia, uh, talking about early escalation, a greater reliance on nuclear capabilities in a conflict, perhaps some mistaken belief that the United States and our allies would not have the ability uh, to respond to those sorts of capabilities. And so. 
What you see in the nuclear posture review is a recommendation for some supplementary capabilities because nuclear deterrence is not static and it won't be one size fits all. We have to up update our toolkit and, our, and be flexible in our application of our principles and our tools to deal with this new environment. So I think nuclear deterrence still holds and it is still a bedrock principle of our defense capability, but our application of it we need to adjust ourselves to the new environment we face in order to keep the nuclear threshold high and not allow for some erosion of that. Assuming for the moment that we do not update our toolkit, uh, to use your phraseology, uh, how long do you think it would be before the mutually assured destruction doctrine no longer worked with China and Russia? Are we talking years or decades? It's a hard question to answer because the circumstances in which it may arise then uh, the context in which we face these kinds of challenges would be the case. There's the, there's the technical capabilities, the destructive capabilities that are on a certain vector in Russia and China, but there's also uh, the, the specific consequences and circumstances around an, an application. So the short answer to your question, uh, Congressman, would be it's very hard to predict, but I don't recommend that we take the risk of remaining static and not being flexible and adjusting our approach and our capabilities. I understand it's forward. hard to give an estimate, but do you have an opinion or a judgment that you can share with us as to when we need to start feeling insecure about the mutually assured destruction doctrine that has kept a nuclear war at bay for uh, roughly six decades? Go, go ahead. So, uh, Congressman, uh, I don't think we have to worry about that for at least a decade. Okay. Uh, I think I think we're the capabilities that we have that we will operate for the next decade will allow us to maintain the basis of nuclear deterrence. But what we have to guard against is we have to guard against a, a miscalculation on behalf of, of our uh, potential adversaries, particularly Russia and China. We can't allow them to think that they can employ a nuclear weapon, whether on the battlefield or strategically, and and the United States will not be able to respond. That's why the mix of capabilities, the diverse capabilities that we talk about in the nuclear posture review help us to increase that deterrent posture. It, it raises uh, the bar for the Russians or the Chinese to take that step across the line and do something foolish that would cause a significant issue. But there is nothing they can do outside of a massive attack against our country uh, that we would not have the ability to respond to. And oh, by the way, our submarines, they do not know where they are and they have the ability to decimate their country if, if, if we go down that path. So I'm confident in that, but we have to modernize these capabilities because 10, 12 years from now, all the capabilities that I operate today will be reaching end of life. We can't allow that to happen without modernizing them and replacing them. Well, I agree with learning from history and certainly with what happened on December 7th, 1941 in Pearl Harbor indicates that it's best to make sure that the other side knows that we're always capable of doing more than they want to deal with. So it seems that our missile interceptor system, uh, to a very large degree, is designed to deal with rogue lesser nations like North Korea and perhaps Iran. Uh, how many interceptors do you think we need in the near future? How many more? And also, do you think we need an East Coast interceptor system as Iran uh, appears to become more and more capable? And I'm almost out of time, so I don't know if the chairman will allow an answer or not. Briefly. The precise number of interceptors is one of the things we're evaluating as part of the missile defense review. In our budget request, you see a request for increase up to 64 uh, that we will initially, those, those are our present plans for ground-based interceptors. We are looking at a mix of capabilities to improve that, to include the th potential for a third site, but we haven't yet made a formal decision as to uh, whether to pursue that and where. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. What we're going to do, we've been called for votes, so I'm going to recognize Mr. Norcross from New Jersey and then Mr. Hunter from California. Then we're going to recess while we go vote, and we'll come back to the closed session after that. So gentleman from New Jersey is recognized for five minutes. Uh, don't need five minutes. I'll wait for closed session, Mr. Chairman. We're moving along. Gentleman from California is recognized. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to go ahead and ask. Uh, General Height and multiple combatant commanders, including yourself, have expressed need for boost phase intercept capability, yet there's not a single line in MDA's budget to holistically address this. It could be the same answer you, you gave to Mr. Lam Lamborn. You do mention nascent energy, uh, directed energy efforts, super risky, super new. From your perspective, I guess this, this is down to uh, brass tacks here, what is the fastest way to get boost phase intercept in the hands 
of the warfighter. Uh, so, Congressman, the boost phase intercept is, a, is an area of significant interest to STRATCOM. Uh, we've stated clearly our requirement uh, to, to move as far left as we can, including left of launch, to get after the missile defense threat. Uh, if you notice, the, uh, the review that's currently underway has changed from a ballistic missile defense review to an overall missile defense review to talk about all those things. Um, I expect those things to be discussed in the missile defense review as well. Uh, but to me, it's really not a technical question. To me, it's a policy question. And the challenge that we have is that uh, if it is a kinetic weapon uh, and we want to attack in the boost phase, that means we have to employ a kinetic weapon inside an adversary's territory. Uh, that is a significant decision for the policymakers in order to make. Uh, I'm a big fan of continuing to pursue directed energy, as Congressman Lamborn talked about a while ago, because I think the, the great thing about directed energy is that if we can employ that in that kind of Directed energy actually continues out into space. It does not come down in an adversary's territory. The technology is, is advancing rapidly in that area right now. But I'll also point out that we've been working that for multiple decades now. And I had a boss once that told me, just remember, you know, directed energy has always been five years away. Uh, so we have to be careful not to put too much, uh, too many eggs in one basket. But, but you uh, only mentioned directed energy. But that's because- In NBA's budget, it only talks about directed energy. And, and Nothing else. We'll talk about, we can talk about details in the classified session that would be much more effective to talk about the details in the classified session. Okay. Thank you very much. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. You bet. Great. Uh, I hate that we get interrupted for votes. We get quality witnesses like you, and we have a lot of questions, but they didn't ask us when we get called for votes. So we're going to have to just recess, and your time is valuable, so we're going to meet in a closed session when we return. We will be gone for about 20 minutes. So with that, we are now... Yeah, in uh, recess.